Hi, I'm Bobby White. I'm the writer slash producer slash mastermind at Swung Over, and I'm honored to have with me David Ream, who is the mastermind slash creator slash promoter of a little tiny camp called The Experiment. Hello, hello. And uh, we're honored to have him here today. And I want to start off by asking David, what on earth do you actually do at The Experiment? I've seen pictures. There's unicorns and small children running around and lots of people writing incredible things about it on Facebook. And yet, I still don't quite understand what goes on there. So, The Experiment is a, an attempt to build the most compelling learning environment we possibly can, um, taking advantage of the power of small, cre uh, small, intimate environments fueled by passionate people. So you say, what happens if we take some really awesome people who really love these dances, who are really passionate about these dances, and who are passionate about, about thinking about that, that, and asking questions, and taking apart their toys, and we put them in this space, uh, and we see what happens. I mean, there's a little bit more to it than that, right? Uh, obviously, we don't put them in that space and then run a traditional teacher-student model. Uh, it certainly doesn't make sense to, to put them in a circle and put the teacher in the middle. Um, that's not taking advantage of, uh, of you know, the possible advantages you have of small, small groups like that um, when you could do that anywhere. So uh, the format then is built around, uh, you know, uh, em encouraging, encouraging uh, self-awareness, self-reliance, uh, and collaborating or sharing with other dancers uh, based on asking questions and uh, giving feedback and trying to become more self-aware and more responsible for one's own learning process. When you mention, when you talk about the experiment, uh, one of the things that always strikes me is is the very specific language you use. So you, for instance, you don't talk about the experiment and say, when the students get there, uh, we teachers get together and we plan a collaborative workshop. Instead, I mean, you have, you say participants and you say, I, I, for fellows and faculty. Um, do you mind talking a little bit more about about that? I mean. Yeah, so uh, you know, there's always this challenge, you know, when, if you take somebody who's brand new to the experiment, they applied, they got accepted, they're excited, they're nervous, you take them all the way out to this place, which is tricky to get to, so they got that long ride on the bus and out over, you know, the four-wheel drive area to get to this, this space, uh, and they're scared, and they're nervous, and they're unsure <laughs> why they paid all this money to come out here, and uh, uh, there's a real challenge for the first couple days, or you know, it, how long? You know, the question is, how long is it before they actually gel with each other and they get it and they get how things work and and then from there it runs itself, right? And that can be some for some groups that used to be you know part way through the week, halfway through the week. And the question is, how can we make that happen sooner? And th simple things like the language help us to reinforce, you know, if, if you put them in there the very first day and you refer to faculty. Um, versus referring to teachers. You think about how that causes somebody to respond differently. It doesn't necessarily tell them the answer, but it tells them, well, that's strange. Why do you use that word? Why not teachers? What's that mean? What's a faculty member at the experiment mean? Um, and so you get them, you at least undermine those traditional assumptions they might make so they don't fall into the traditional models that they're used to. So now, over the years, I mean, I mean how many participants have there been so far? Uh, so there are nearly... 200 alumni of the experiment, I believe. So, so nearly 200 people who go around and then they talk about it all year on Facebook. So I think that now people have an understanding vaguely that it's something different. But the first year or two, it, people didn't know that. Like what, like what was it like when they got there and you just kind of threw the, did you throw them in the deep end? Or what? <laughs> well, not only did the participants not know, the, the staff didn't know. We had lots of ideas about you know, how cool this would be and, and what we might do there. Um, and ultimately, we ended up being overly cautious the first year or two. We just weren't sure, you know, we didn't want to get these people there and then have the first thing be so out there that it was alienating, you know, and, it, and sort of, you need to build a certain vocabulary and you need to build a certain you know, relationship and trust between the participants to each other and to the faculty who are asking them to do these sort of new formats and things. So we were really conservative. Uh, and what we found was is that the, the things that we took the biggest risks on ended up paying off the best. And so we learned to trust if we were, as faculty, if we were excited about something, like, hey, that's a really cool idea, 
I would like to participate in that session. Forget about running it. I would like to be in the room and get to play with that. Um, uh, to trust ourselves, if we found those kinds of ideas, to, to run with them, let the participants run with them and see what happens from it. And that's been very successful. So that's a lesson we've learned that we continue to, to evolve based on taking certain risks, seeing how they go. And it's very iterative then. The experiment's super, super iterative. So every year, almost nothing is exactly the same as the previous year, but almost nothing is so radically uh, oppositional to what we did in the past. We're constantly um, uh, very scientific, constantly testing things, making slight changes, testing it again, each week, every week, each year. And I know that from, uh, so from being uh, part of the faculty over the years, I know that our I know for me personally, it's changed a whole lot from the beginning about like what my role is, and each year I keep on playing and tinkering with that role. Um, but that kind of reminds. So, how do you hire people for this? Like what? Like again, you're taking just like it's not just like they're no longer students; they're participants now. These are no longer dance teachers. There's something else. That isn't. That has definitely been a really interesting thing. I used to say. Um, so to run the experiment, what we did is we went out and we hired, in my opinion, some of the very best battle teachers in the world. We put them in a room and we told them they're not allowed to, te not allowed to teach. <laughs> uh, you know, and so sometimes they would teach too much and I'd have to smack their hand a little bit and say, no, no, back off. Let, the, let, them, let them take their risks or let them make the mistakes sometimes and let them see what comes out of it. And then, you know, then they would back off and say, no, no, I need more from you. But trying to help them find that place and what it means to sort of moderate and coach, um, but not explicitly teach. It's an entirely different skill set. Um, and they've done some amazing things with it, but it's a new thing. It's something they don't get to do elsewhere necessarily. Certainly not in the same way. Certainly not in the same environment with such small numbers and such a high level often. Um, and then in terms of selecting those people, I mentioned, you know, in my opinion, some of the, uh, some fantastic teachers. Uh, but also, uh, you know, so some of that reflects my personal values. You notice the follows of the experiment are some of the follows I work with regularly that I have a relationship with when I, I believe that they're exceptional dancers and exceptional teachers and have something to contribute. Um, they also have a certain relationship to Southern California and the original dancers. Um, you know, many of these people, Nick and Laura and Jeremy, uh, certainly living out there and, you know, us on the East Coast, but who regularly made our pilgrimages out there, you know, had a respect and admiration for the old timers. And at the same time, I think everybody on our faculty um, uh, definitely has a unique voice as a teacher and a unique voice to their dancing, which is not simply trying to copy this one thing. So uh, I think they all are great examples of uh, a respect for the original dance and original dancers while having something unique to contribute to that overall progression. Uh, and that's something that I, I believe in strongly and that informs our, our hiring decisions. Uh, hearing you talk about the hearing you talk about this whole process reminds me of one of my uh, I absolutely love this. It's, it's something that David used a few times in the introduction at the experiment. Uh, and correct me if I get it wrong. But basically the idea is that, so you have all of these students here, or participants, you have all these participants in the room, and you say, so we're here for, or we're here, we are here for an organic learning experience. Huh. And you think to yourself, organic learning experience, uh, people think that that's just like, you know, we're just going to put you in a room and see what happens. Um, and you use the analogy, well, if you're a gardener making an organic garden, if you just plant a bunch of stuff and see what happens, guess what's going to happen? Yeah, there's, uh, you know, that analogy, uh, it's something I'm, I'm, I love that analogy because a lot of people think organic means you sort of just let it go. Uh, and the thing is, is that uh, you know, things like pesticides and, you know, those things, they, they serve a purpose, right? Because if you just planted it and let it go, uh, it's not going to do so well. Uh, so you can choose to remove certain tools like pesticides and stuff if you want to grow an organic farm. But then actually you have to do an awful lot of work to do the work that those tools would have accomplished if you hadn't removed them, right? So the idea for the students, uh, the participants, this is your fault. <laughs> uh, the idea for the participants at the experiment, uh, you know, is to understand that if we take out the traditional teacher model, it doesn't mean it automatically works. In fact, it really, really doesn't. <laughs> um, it means that uh, each of you has to do a lot of that work, um, which used to be done by teachers. Because if you don't, uh, you know, that process of curating the dialogue, making sure things don't get sidetracked, dealing with 
personality disputes, dealing with managing time, um, uh, making sure this person doesn't dominate the conversation or that this person doesn't get stepped over. All those sort of logistical things about group dynamics, um, it needs to be dealt with because it doesn't work itself out. But if you do a good job of that, then some really awesome things can come out of it. So, yeah, if you take out the pesticide, you still got to do a lot of work to keep the bugs from eating your stuff if you want to have a successful organic garden. And so I guess that's something that's been a large part of the last, uh, I mean, the last four years of the, uh, sorry, the last five years of the experiment. Five years. Which has had 12 weeks, and next year we'll have four weeks of the Balboa and one week of the blues. The blues. <laughs> so I think that, that announcement, uh, which came out re relatively recently, uh, I think probably surprised a lot of people. Do you mind talking a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, this is uh, a question I've gotten an awful lot the last several months. Actually, I started talking about this at the beginning of the year, um, but certainly it didn't hit the, the interwebs and the Facebooks until the last few months. Um, this is very simple, actually. I uh, am not a blues dancer. I'm not professing to be a blues dancer or to know anything about blues. I do, however, uh, I have had the, the, the great fortune, the experiment as a whole has had the great fortune of having uh, Mike the Girl uh, as a, a multi-year alumnus. Um, she's been a fantastic bow participant. She herself loves bow. Uh, and she, uh, I think, really truly understands the experiment format, uh, as well as her other life, apparently as a world-renowned blues instructor, uh, and an all-around awesome person. Um, and so the idea of trying, you know, of expanding the experiment to other dances had intrigued me, but the challenge was how do you hire new faculty and have to start over with them and get them to understand what their job is at the experiment. But here we had a case where we had this awesome person who, who totally gets it from the role of being a participant and, and who, who embraces it, who has come back in that role, who's also excited about blues and was excited about the possibility of maybe expanding and doing um, you know, a version of the experiment for the blues community. So uh, yeah, I, I would not have, it's not a project I would have endeavored on my own, but it, it all comes out of Mike. Uh, and that unique opportunity of having Mike sort of in both worlds there um, and to help us bridge that gap, not only with the participants, but also with the other faculty. Um, to help us find that, that common ground where the experiment format applies and, and also where they'll have to be making changes. So, yeah. But you're only starting off with one week of the blues experiment. That's correct. Uh, just like the bow experiment started with only one week, right? You can't launch a camp and suddenly say, ta-da, I'm launching my brand new camp. It's, you know, two months. It doesn't work that way. Um, you've got to start somewhere. We started with one week for bow, uh, work out the kinks, you know, get the faculty used to the format, get the participants used to the format, expand it to two, expand it to three. Um, you know, so the expansion comes based on demand. If the applications are there, people are excited about it, and they say, hey, you know, 30 slots isn't enough, we have the ability to expand in a way that doesn't compromise our format. So we can add multiple weeks, uh, we benefit from the economy of scale, um, you know, logistically, and yet we don't compromise the format by having suddenly 50 people in the house. It's, it keeps the current format, keeps that intimate environment, um, and allows us to accept a wider range of a wider number of participants and a wider range of levels. So, yeah, depending on applications, we might see more than one Blues Week. Speaking of applications, I think that might be one aspect of the camp that scares the shit out of people. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so tell us a little bit about the application process and, yeah, what it's about. So, uh, minus the fact that people immediately think of applying to college or applying for a job, which are scary things. Ultimately, the application process is just like a level test. The point is, um, you know, uh, traditional camps know this, right? You students, uh, the participants at a camp um, work better. The learning environment works better if those people have some common ground. Uh, they have, you know, they're somewhat similar in level. Um, hopefully, they share. Uh, certain values, although a lot of times at a camp that's based on, well, they went to it based on the teachers who are there or geographically where it is. And so uh, the point of a level test at any camp is to sort of build successful groups and to ensure those groups are, are successful um, because the hardest thing for, for teachers to deal with is a very wide range of levels where the, it's too mixed um, and they don't have enough in common to try to embrace all of them at once. So the application process is, is our version of a level test. The difference is uh, two differences, right? One, 
we don't have the advantage of having everybody in the same room, so we have to do it months and months and months in advance over the internet. And two, uh, you know, balancing things for our environment in includes a lot more concern about things like interests uh, and personalities in addition to overall level. So, um, you know, if you had one token dancer there who didn't care at all about competition and everybody else did, think about how that person's experience isn't going to be so collaborative because they don't have values in common with the other participants. So whether you're more or less interested in teaching, more or less interested in competition, in performance, uh, in history, in, in the original dancers or not, some people are very interested in that, some people are less interested in that. Um, you know, event hosting and scene building and, and uh, pure bow versus bow swing, you know, all those different interests. So the, the application process helps us build groups that we think will be successful within the format based on um, personalities and skill sets and also how they will interrelate with the other uh, participants in their week. So what, uh, if you have, so let's say next week we have four weeks. How many participants is that? Uh, so there are 30 participants a week. So 120 Balboa students and then 30 blue students. Yeah, there will be 150 uh, participants to the experiment next year. Wow. So, uh, so let's say that you're an average, or let's say that you're a Balboa dancer who's been dancing Balboa long enough to know what the experiment is and want to, and maybe want to apply, but they're not sure if they should apply or not. What is some advice that you might have for them making that decision? Fill in the boxes. Hit submit. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> uh, take it. The, so, self awareness is the hard part, right? Like, how do you actually know? you know, whether these jeans make my ass look fat. Like, how do we know that? You ask, <laughs> you ask somebody else because you need that, you need, it's hard to gauge certain things about ourselves, right? That's why level tests are necessary at, at big camps. Um, and that's also, you know, if you're from this town in the middle of nowhere in, in this country or that country or wherever you are, you don't know how to interrelate your level versus somebody else's level from a completely different place you've never even been to. Um, so, you know, some people you know, think, oh, I'm not advanced enough, and they're totally there, they're ready, they would be great candidates. You know, uh, you know some people, uh, maybe it's the opposite, where, uh, you know, they don't understand why, you know, they shouldn't be the first on the list to get accepted, but obviously, perhaps somebody else got accepted instead. Um, so, self-awareness is tricky. Self-awareness is obviously one of the big themes of the camp. How do we build self-awareness and get you to think about how to gauge your progress. Where am I? How did I get here? What are my options? How could I make changes um, to do things differently or better or just have a different experience or produce a different experience for my partners? So um, ultimately, instead of worrying about how to gauge or measure yourself or whatever, just fill in the application, uh, send it in, take a chance. A lot of people tell us the application process uh, has helped them or made them better in some way just by forcing them to answer tough questions because we do ask questions about your goals and what you think your strengths and weaknesses are. It's also interesting to see the change in people's answers from year to year. So sometimes uh, people have much better answers after a year or two. Uh, and I, not, not to necessarily take credit for that. You know, whether, whether us asking those questions sort of sends them on some journey where they, they explore those over the course of a year or two, or whether it just is an evidence of their own progression as dancers. Um, but yeah, send us an application Take a look at the questions. Uh, give it a chance. And might I mention, uh, send it in sooner rather than closer to the deadline because it really helps a lot. Yeah. I, uh, so yeah, the earlier you get your application, and we do we have an early application deadline now. In addition to the final deadline, uh, there's incentives or rewards for meeting the early deadline even, uh, and that's just to help us distribute the workload of processing applications, which is I mean it takes upwards of 100 man hours a year by the by the judging panel. There is a, you know, a full judging panel that, that goes through this stuff and makes those decisions. It's very time intensive. So, you know, if all the applications come in in the last 48 hours, um, you know, that's obviously difficult for us to manage that time. It takes longer before we can start sending acceptance letters, etc. But if you get them in early, we can distribute that workload better. It gives us more time to uh, consider your application, so that's in your, uh, to your advantage. And, um, makes our lives easier. <laughs> so you mentioned, when you mentioned the, uh, when you mentioned the applications and how some people found actually going through the application process in itself a very helpful thing, um, have you been surprised at some of the things that the students find, uh, sorry, the participants find great deal of value in at the experiment? Like, or has there been something surprising about, 
Like, has, an, has a participant come up and say, you know what was the most incredible thing about this weekend? Was the bacon in the morning was so fantastic that I just had energy all day, and now I'm going to eat bacon before I go practice <laughs> swing dancing for the rest of my life? That's a horrible example, by the way. It's okay. Bacon's important. Uh, there are lots of surprises to the experiment, to running the experiment, to seeing how people interact. Uh, one of the first things to say about any surprises at the experiment is that every week is completely different no matter what we do. It doesn't matter. We could tr go in and try to run the same session exactly the same way. If you were watching it, you wouldn't be able to resemble it to be the same. Uh, different groups end up with having different temperaments, different attitudes and personalities, different interests, different subjects that come up. Uh, we talk, the faculty talk about this all the time because we see it. Still, to this day, we'll have uh, you know, somebody join us as a volunteer for more than one week, and all they do the second week is talk about how crazy different it is from the previous week <laughs> and how they didn't really understand how much we meant that when we say that. So every group is so very different, um, which is definitely the biggest surprise. And then the feedback represents that, right? So somebody, inevitably, I will get at least one or two people who will tell me that each session throughout the week was their favorite and was much better than the others, <laughs> and they don't understand why we didn't do more of those. Uh, and I'll get that for every session we do. Absolutely, positively, every session. Um, <laughs> people have different interests, they have different values, they have different goals, they have different personalities. Um, and the experiment tries to offer a wide collage of those things. Uh, it hopes to get them some things that are, that are you know, perfectly right down the middle of exactly what they want, uh, and also some things that maybe they might not have thought uh, of before, but which they ultimately find value in. Another thing that always amazes me is how there's always usually one person who wants that session to have been the first thing that we did every to time. Set up everything, and so like every throughout the night, like we can only have one. There can only be one per session. <laughs> so you'll do a session the second day, they'll be like, I really wish you'd done this one first instead, and then you do one later that day or third day. I mean, they would be much better if you did this one the first one. And ultimately, what they're saying is all of them are valuable, and they would, you know. Yeah, that's that's a compliment, but it's it's amazing. I I just need to take a recorder like this and record every person saying that, <laughs> and make a collage of the booch, booch, booch. You really should have done this the first day. <laughs> booch, booch, booch. Uh, wow. Well, I think we talked about a lot of great stuff. Was there anything, anything we didn't talk about that you wanted to make sure got said? Uh. I mean, I'd love to talk about it. There's lots of things to say about the experiment. Um, I'm, I'm always eager to hear questions. I, everywhere I go, I am in, inundated by questions in person. Um, but, yeah, if you have your questions, send us an email. You can reply. I assume you're posting this uh, on the interwebs. Leave, you know, leave us a, a question. You know, we could, uh, I'm happy to respond to those individually, or we could do a follow-up or something. Um, the, maybe I'll just close on the fact you know, trying to encourage this idea of open communication. I mean, the experiment itself is built on this idea of building these relationships between people, um, helping them build the skill set of how to interact and collaborate and communicate. So how do you look at something and understand what you're looking at and how do you articulate it to another person and how do you, how do you accept that sort of feedback and then respond back and, and how do we interact? Um, and... The same thing is true about the experiment's format as a whole. You know, I think in the beginning, uh, it's, the it's the story I mentioned earlier about the, uh, the flyers, right? So when we oh, very first launched, the, when we first launched the experiment, right, <laughs> um, you know, we ended up with this very cryptic, very brief little teaser flyer, uh, you know, which just said, you know, uh, a, couple, a couple of staff names that were confirmed at the time, right, Nick and myself, and 24... Uh, uh, Participants and uh, you know multi-million dollar beach house, the experiment, dun, dun, dun. and uh, uh, you know people went nuts. You know what's this weird thing and you know conspiracy theories and stuff. And ultimately, it all comes down. You know, I, after the fact, I would love to say you know oh yes, I was the mastermind and I brilliantly planned how to create all this intrigue and curiosity about this crazy thing. Ultimately, that's what's called a teaser flyer. And the reason promoters put out teaser flyers is because they don't have any other details to give you yet, <laughs> because nothing is done yet. <laughs> So we were trying to do this thing, none of the details are solidified, a big event was coming up that we wanted to advertise at, and that's all we could put on paper without getting in trouble for putting any other <laughs> details on paper that turned out to be wrong later because it wasn't fixed yet, right? So afterwards it makes you look like, you know, it looks like a marketing mastermind, but ultimately it was just for lack of concrete details. Um, but that set up this weird thing about the, uh, this weird trend of people perceiving the experiment as being mysterious, and yet 
I think people are always surprised whenever they actually talk to me in person directly or one of the participants or staff about how much we won't shut up about the experiment. If you've got a question about how we do things or why, uh, we'd love to talk to you about it. We, we are super excited and passionate about what we do there, and we're curious to hear about people who are doing you know, some interesting things that are related to that or trying some of our stuff. Um, and uh, you know, there's no secret in that way. It's just a matter of you know, we, we have a smaller set of participants, so there's fewer people out in the world there who can say, yes, this is what it is in any given conversation when it might come up. Um, but they're, they're around, you can find them, ask them, ask me, and we're happy to talk about that stuff. Yeah, I know from my part, and I, I'm, I also mentioned this to almost anyone who asked me about it, is kind of being in the experiment is kind of like living in paradise for a while for me. I really, really love it. All right, well, thank you so much for coming, and people should apply by going to... Uh, so, again, remember, there's a Battle Experiment now and a Blues Experiment. They have uh, different sites with their own application deadlines, the, Bal the balboaexperiment.com, and that deadline's in, in November, uh, and the bluesexperiment.com, which is also in November, but it's like a week later, I think, is that deadline. So uh, check those out. Send us an application. Send us any questions if you have them. Excellent. Thank you so much, David. Thank you.